Charles Dickens wrote of the warrior, a black, vicious, ugly customer as ever I saw. Whale-like in size, and with as terrible a row of incisor teeth as ever closed on a French frigate. HMS Warrior transformed concepts of naval warfare when she first joined the fleet in 1861 as part of Britain's response to an uneasy peace with France and concerns over French maritime ambitions. Warrior was revolutionary. At a stroke, all existing ships were rendered obsolete. Warrior housed all her main guns, engines and vital services within an armoured iron hull and could move under sail or steam. The combination of armour plate, iron hull, breech loading guns and powerful steam propulsion meant that she could outgun and outrun any ship afloat. HMS Warrior was built at Thames Ironworks Blackwall, London to the order of Admiral Baldwin Walker and under the watchful eye of the Navy's chief designer Isaac Watts. She was built at a time of rapid change and was overtaken by new designs in a matter of just a few years. Warrior's active service life as a first-line battleship lasted a mere 12 years. HMS Victory, Cutty Sark and SS Great Britain have all been saved by complex restoration programs. As a pivotal Royal Navy ship, Warrior had not been forgotten and in 1968 a trust was formed to save the great ship. In August 1979, the 120-year-old Hulk began a journey to Hartlepool. After eight years and eight million pounds, the fully restored warrior returned to Portsmouth on the 16th of June 1987, in front of tens of thousands of spectators to occupy the purpose-built berth at the entrance to the naval dockyard. The attention to detail during the restoration was perfect. As you step on board this black battleship, you enter another world, the world of the Victorian sailor. The aim of the Warrior Preservation Trust had been to restore the ship as near as possible to her 1860 condition, wanting you to feel like the ship's company had just gone ashore. The upper deck on Warrior is large, an unbroken level deck of 380 feet in length and 58 feet in width. Unlike previous designs, she had no raised poop deck or quarter deck, nor a raised forecastle. She has a rudimentary bridge and armoured conning tower to control the ship in battle. From the upper deck, seamanship evolutions were controlled, setting the sails, steering and navigation. Warrior has two bridges, thin walkways stretched across the beam of the ship, one forward between the fore and main mast and one aft between the main and mizzen masts. The bridges are unprotected and completely open. Warrior's steering was under the control of the helm, maintained by two wheels, one on the upper deck aft and one directly below on the main deck. Each wheel has space for eight men 
and in rough conditions all 16 would be needed. They would still struggle to hold the ship on course. The wheel must complete six full turns to turn the rudder from harder port to harder starboard. Warrior marks the Royal Navy in transition, looking back to the glory days of sail and forwards to the steam engine propulsion era. Warrior carried 48,400 square feet of sail, all of which had to be set and trimmed manually. For the majority of Warrior's crew, the main deck was their world, where they ate, slept, worked and played amongst the ship's main armament. The crew were organised into messes, with each mess occupying the space between two of the main guns. A table and bench seats were lowered from the deck head to provide seating for some 18 men. At night, the crew unrolled their hammocks, slinging them from the iron hooks set into the cross members of the deck head above. In the center of the ship is the galley, where food for the whole crew was prepared. Food was plentiful, if sometimes of variable quality. The galley staff comprised of former seamen, disabled or retired from more active work. Their knowledge of cookery was likely to be scant. Sitting just aft of the galley is the issue room, where the mess deck cooks would draw the food supplements for the day, and also items such as soap. The most popular place on the main deck is the rum issue area. For almost 300 years, there was a tradition in the Royal Navy until 1970 that every sailor over the age of 20 was served a half pint of rum at 11 o'clock every morning. The officers lived in the wardroom occupying the aft section of the main deck. Here there is a central dining and recreation space with cabins for the officers around the edge. The commander's cabin, as second in command, has much of the feel of the captain's cabin, with carpet on the deck, padded furniture and panelled walls. A vast amount of space, in every way conveying the senior position of the commander. The captain's quarters are an enormous expanse of space, compared to the conditions endured by the ordinary seamen and stokers. In the enormous day cabin, furnished with the feel and quality of a country house, the captain controlled the movement of the ship and the lives of every man on board. His was the final responsibility for everything that happened on Warrior. Warrior was designed to be the most powerful warship afloat, with a superior armament to any ship she may meet. To achieve fire superiority, Isaac Watts, the designer of Warrior, had to mount heavier guns. He decided to do this on a single long gun deck, breaking the traditional design concept of lighter guns on two or three decks. To protect the guns from bombardment by a similar ship, Watts designed the guns to sit inside an armoured citadel. Shells for the breech-loading Armstrong guns were stored in magazines well below the waterline and hoisted to the main deck when required. The powder used for Warrior's 68-pounder guns 
were stored in separate powder magazines at the other end of the ship. The level of authenticity is nowhere better seen than when viewing the massive array of small arms which were produced and now fill the ship. Pistols were kept on a crocus mounting aft for use by officers. These are Navy Colt revolvers using the new percussion cap cartridges. The Warrior also carries 350 muzzle-loading Lee Enfield rifles for use by seamen and marines. These were fitted with bayonets and kept in racks on the gun deck. Deep in the bowels of the ship are the boiler and engine rooms. This is the domain of stokers, trimmers and engineers. From here, they physically manhandled 850 tons of coal from the bunkers to the furnaces and then shoveled the ash and clinker waste away from the furnace grates. This was a filthy job in appalling conditions. Men were shoveling and carrying coal on a moving deck in temperatures of 112 degrees Fahrenheit. Having coal on board Warrior brought with it a few unexpected bonuses. She was the first ship to have a purpose-built bathroom and an onboard laundry. Warrior's boilers were only able to generate steam at a relatively low pressure, which drove the twin-cylinder steam engine at a maximum speed of 56 RPM pushing Warrior through the water at about 14 knots. Although not fast by modern standards, it would be faster than any ship of comparable size could manage under sail alone. The 850 ton coal load would not give great range, so steam power was intended as a sprint addition to the sails. When the ship went over to steam propulsion, the propeller had to be lowered into position and locked into the drive shaft. At the same time, the funnel was raised to carry away the furnace exhaust. Transferring from sail to steam required the captain to give the order up funnel, down screw. Steam power gave Warrior an immediate advantage over any similar sized sailing warship. She was not dependent on the wind and could sail at will and wherever she wanted. <laughs> 